You look terrible. Why don't you eat? Why don't you the rest of the world and a month from now, this Hollywood big shot's gonna give you what you want? It's too late. They start shooting in a week. I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes, and I thought I'd have a little bit of a different flavored conversation here today. Obviously, we've already talked about X-Men here on, on this beautiful Sunday, but, you know, I think we all have have hope. There's always hope that maybe DC Comics maybe can change course. Marvel Comics can kind of uh, maybe change their stripes a little bit, or maybe, you know, some new guys can come in, maybe take over. You know, obviously, there was a lot of buzz about you know, there, there's these super rich fans. Maybe we're going to buy DC Comics and start publishing DC kind of the the way that the fans would. Uh, and, you know, I think a lot of people would like for that to happen. But we do have a, a curmudgeon here on the channel that wants to, I guess, piss in everybody's Wheaties. He's a little bit down on these things. He thinks that the the um, with the way that DC and Marvel have integrated themselves in these mega entertainment corporations... And in the case of AT&T, a, a communications and media entity, that it's there, it might not be able to come back. And here to talk to me, obviously, about that is the X-Men historian, the Marvel aficionado. Doc, what's up, buddy? Oh, not too much, Wes. Thanks for having me on. Um, this is a this is kind of an interesting topic to me because you know, for a lot of what I do outside of outside of reading comics and bullshitting on on your channel is i look at <clears throat> risk and hazard assessment and shit like that <clears throat> and i see all the ways in which things can go wrong that's that's part of what i do so looking at you know looking at the the situation in the comics industry I can see where the a lot of the solutions are, but I also am really good at applying the law of unintended consequences to the solutions that are always proposed. And I, I think we've we've hit beyond a critical mass point. Well, what's interesting, you know, we we do know that DC Comics would like to license out their publishing, but they are asking an extraordinary amount of uh, money. For, you know, essentially, the comic industry itself is is growing, but the Western comics and periodics, they're contracting a little bit. And if they aren't contracting, they're essentially staying the same. There's not a lot of growth there. So there's not going to be a lot of companies just frothing at the mouth to create their own new comic book publishing arm so they can go out and license DC's co uh, characters and start publishing these comic books or whatnot. So while, while DC, Warner Media would probably like to offload this as a licensing deal, the, the price is so high, there might not be anyone willing to take it as is. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's a great point. <clears throat> you have you have a situation where, as it stands right now, it makes DC X number of dollars per year. Or it makes, oh, sorry, it doesn't, it, it makes, it makes AT&T X number of dollars per year. And so, but it costs them less than that. They want to be able to, keep that profit but not half the cost so they're looking to you know, even if they're taking only a portion of that and asking that 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 profit as as the licensing costs now anybody that actually has the money to do it doesn't want to because it costs too much and anyone that does want to do it doesn't have the money to do it well, and plus you got the other thing that do I really want to pay uh, AT and T, Warner Media, DC Comics, so I can offload the problem they created and fix it for them? Yeah, I mean, just that's so what that... you're going to have to do because they're the you know essentially Marvel and DC and the way that they've been running their business for the past probably ten years, maybe a little bit more, are the reasons that we're seeing stagnant or or uh, you know a little bit of regression as far as the the comic buying you know customer base. Yeah, and if they do solve that, say 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 you had a, a guy that or a guy or a lady that, that had a great vision, knew exactly how to fix this. It, the minute they do DC and, and like grow the audience and get this you know large number of people, this influx of new readers or lapsed readers to come back and start reading these products. DC sees what the money that they're or Warner Brothers and AT&T see what they're leaving on the table and then the licensing agreement. Yeah. 
and and then <clears throat> so as a solution the people that want to, that might have that idea they want to buy it well now they buy it but they don't have the rights to the properties of anything that they they did i mean where does where does the cost i mean what do you get if you buy it if you just bought the publishing you you probably don't get the licensing for toys and t-shirts and stuff like that you obviously don't get the movies and television um so what incentive do you have to create and really grow the the, the brand if AT&T and Warner Brothers are the ones that are going to, and, and Hasbro and you know Kenner that make the toys and you know whoever the hell makes the t-shirts if they're the ones that are going to really you know benefit from the work you're putting in on regrowing the the comic division really when you think about what dc and marvel have created themselves and really there's nothing they can do about it they're part of an enormous corporate structure now they do not have free will on how to govern or run their own businesses anymore they are a little bitty tiny piece in an enormous machine yeah that is, you know on the obvious uh, i don't want to say obviously but basically insignificant to the big scheme of things so let's say so they're just kind of sitting there. They obviously don't want to price themselves down. They don't want to give this stuff away. And they definitely want to retain rights for movies, television, licensing uh, for all the toys and stuff. Because that's like $1.5 billion annually for DC Comics just on the licensing agreements. They don't have to do anything. That's bigger than the entire comic book industry, at least Western comics. But we're seeing growth in comic books through manga, YA graphic novels and things. But if you want to do it in the Western, like, t you know, traditional superhero comics, you have to go and compete with the characters that DC and Marvel own that they aren't managing correctly. So you end up having to invest an enormous, enormous amount of money to go out and get acquire new customers and get them reading your comic books and realize that you're doing it right by, versus what they're doing. You saw what happened with Valiant Comics. They had an amazing shared comic book universe. Nobody read it. Correct. Nobody read it. Um, you know, Valiant couldn't even get to number three. They couldn't even get to number four. They weren't even really in the top ten. No. And, and and I mean, I've heard wonderful, wonderful things about like Exo and Rye and Bloodshot and all the other books. Um, but you know what? I can personally say from my experience, I didn't read it. I didn't read it because I didn't care. And um it, it, it so you're you're already and that this is the problem that you're going to have with the majority of the superhero western comics audience they're set in their goddamn ways sorry i mean you you can we like we like to talk about how you know indie stuff can blow up and yeah i guess it can but it's it's one book it's one creator it's not a universe it's not an entire line um you know it's taken what incentive do at&t and disney really have to go and invest in acquiring new talent new ideas and think outside the box and just grow the comic book industry when they could be using those resources getting those people to go and grow their streaming services or their movie division or come up with the best new television property Exactly. And that's you're, where, where you're stuck in this catch-22 where this industry, as far as Western comic books and su superheroes in general, is just stagnant and just it cannot really go anywhere. And, and, yeah, exactly. It, it's a catch-22. There's, you know, it's it's just a bunch of, you know, kind of, you know, you fix this problem, you create this problem. You fix this problem, you brought back the first problem. Um, you make an investment here you're losing money over there um you know, you're there's no there's no way to fix it like i mean we have this problem with with the the cover price on books being uh you know prohibitive and, and ter essentially turns off potential new readers but it turns off lifelong readers it does i it know people that had read comics their entire lives since they were like eight years up old until they were 30 and they dropped it. They're like, finally, the $4 cover price is too much. Now we're at five. Yeah. And so, 
the problem is the covers the prices are too high the the distribution is too small you know but if they drop the cover price all they're going to do is end up dropping the 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 quality the already diminished quality of talent and and, i mean can can marvel's paper stock get any worse no dcs can barely get any worse marvel could theoretically print their comic books on toilet paper and go half a step lower than where they are right now in their cover. Uh, yeah, but it's still, I don't think that would even save them any money at this point. The technology <laughs> to print on toilet paper without it tearing <laughs> might actually cost more than what they're printing on right now that's only marginally above toilet paper. But DC can't really, get, so you can't really drop that's the. That's crazy. If they want to drop the cover price to where it's more affordable for people. They will literally have to go to their corporate entities and say, listen, we need to take a loss for three years to get the cover price down so we can grow the audience and bring back and show some goodwill. And so people can have faith in the company again and and start to grow. And they'll be like, oh, you want to take losses? Yeah, no. We just had the Fox acquisition over Disney. You just had the the enormous – Warner Media acquisition over at AT and T. I believe that company has the most debt of any company in the history of the world. I'm expecting they're not exactly willing to take losses right now, so that you can co- lower your cover price because your corporate strategies before they even acquired you were so silly and short sighted that you couldn't see the trees through the forest. Yeah, exactly. There's no way that these companies are going to say because that's that's what the solution needs to be. The comic industry needs to operate essentially at least the big two at what is ostensibly going to be a loss at best a wash. You know, if you're if you're doing like Venom and you know, all your your top five top ten books, and the only thing that you can hope to do is sell enough copies to break even in order to drop the cover price to maybe bring some audience back, maybe grow, you know, bring some of the lapsed readers back, maybe get some new readers because look, I mean, I I'm not a big fan of manga, but I know that it's huge among, among youth at this point because it's friggin' cheap. And it's got superheroes. You got superhero tales. It's cheaper. And guess what? A lot of younger readers aren't like you doc. They haven't been reading Western style comic books since they were seven years old. So they've been doing it for 35 yeah. years of their entire lives. They can go, you know what? I like this Batman, but this My Hero Academia is so much cheaper and the story is better. I don't care that it's in black and white. Let's jump on that train. And it, it's not going to be a big change for them because they're not completely ingrained into it. And that's they're, how the big two have completely lost two, maybe three generations of new readers. Essentially, yeah. And as much as the big two have loved to say, you know, with their with their publishing initiatives and this and that with the, you know, Marvel now and then DC's, you know, future state and and moving into the future and kind of copying Marvel's homework from 2012 to 2018, uh, you know, with trying to find this hip, young, new, diverse audience, their sales strategy. And nothing but milk the lifelong reader and creator with variant schemes, ratio variants, the stuff that you aim at completists for in order to hopefully maybe hope that one of this diverse, young, hip, new audience drunkenly stumbles into a comic shop and says, Oh, hey, there's 500 copies of this number one on a shelf. I'll buy it for $4. Well, now I think the comic industry has kind of figured out they might have milked the the life, the the collector out where they're they're just saying like, screw it. I'm just going to get the the stuff I like. The completion thing isn't maybe isn't so important. Obviously, there's still those. But now they're on. They're trying to bleed the speculators dry again. Oh, yeah. We know how well that turned out. So I. The, the big two, I, I think, is a wash. What I the big hope is that it is from the indie scene. Someone comes up with a better mousetrap, a better idea on how to create, distribute, and acquire new customers as far as traditional Western comics. And the problem there is, not only do you have to overcome DC and Marvel, who have all the characters that are in the movies and that have eighty years of history and all that, 
But once you overcome them, then you're going to go and compete with manga. Yeah. It has like eight years ahead of you as there's been significant growth for quite some time on that market. Yeah, and I, I mean, I know some of the indies, especially the crowdfunded, or they're trying to look at some of these these problems and trying to, I mean, they're trying to solve it with YouTube and, and having a Twitter audience and this and that, and and maybe to some degree it's <clears throat> it's translating into sales, but all they've but done is the crowdfunding it, thing. It's but I it's, love it's, crowdfunding. I think it's brilliant. I think it's wonderful. It's a great alternative for creators and customers to go and find the creators that they like and support them. At, at a cost, at a premium cost. The problem yep. is, even on the most successful crowdfunding comic campaigns, for the most part, like the max backers is like four or 5,000 people. Exactly. When you're talking about an, a, a, a volume of manga in one year, you're talking millions. Exactly. I That's the point I was going to get to. Like, I know that the, the, the crowdfunders are trying to solve this, but they're solving it all wrong. They're, they're further ghettoizing themselves into smaller and smaller audiences, smaller distribute, no distribution change. Um, you know, instead of appealing to a, a larger audience, they're appealing to a smaller one. Everyone, every solution that everyone has come up with over the past few years has essentially just shrunk western comics and it sucks because you know what somebody needs to do is they essentially need to ignore the fact that the comic industry even exists and start something from yes. entirely scratch forget about what dc's doing forget about what marvel's doing hell forget about what image do, is doing because their uh, their model in and of itself is problematic as far as for growth yeah it doesn't grow anything for, for long term Somebody needs to come in, break down exactly how the industry operates, who the customer bases are, how to bring back some of the lifelong readers that have left, and what it would take to start growing an audience without thinking about what DC and Marvel have done to, to destroy everything for so long. And, and honestly, I don't know if it's possible to overcome all the negative like kind of juju that they've put into the market they've essentially poisoned the 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 potential customer base because the minute people start thinking about comics they start thinking about marvel dc overpriced comics on cheap crappy paper for way too much money with bad stories Somehow well, you the time even it's have the same stories over and over. Well, yeah, a a but with progressively worse and worse and worse creators and worse and worse execution. So somebody needs to, they need to overcome that too. And I don't know if it's possible. Yeah, I, I mean, legitimately we saw, don't. We just saw who is it? Uh, Joe Mad is going to finally finish his his Battle, Battle Chaser series. He is a wonderful comic book storyteller, brilliant artist. Now, he was not known to meet a lot of deadlines. We could admit that. Battle Chasers was coming in later and later as time went on. How long ago was it when he actually delivered issue nine? Uh, almost exactly 20 years. Almost 20 years ago. And why did he leave the industry 20 years ago when things were pretty healthy? Because he could make a shit ton more money in video designing video games. And he wasn't anywhere near on the same monthly clock. Yes. The, the best talents have already, for the what? most part, moved on. Mark and, Miller, and, one of the better comic writers that in the industry. Does he need comic books anymore with Miller World? Essentially, other than to kind of... Uh, because he loves comics. He, yeah, and, and the product need comics. He's got fuck you money. You know, just from entertainment in general. He doesn't need comics. He does it because he wants to. And because he likes to product test things in comic form before they get to see what worked, see what didn't work. with At a much smaller scale, at a much cheaper risk to himself and his company, yes. Yep, before Netflix turns it into a TV show. But he doesn't, but he doesn't, he doesn't need it. No, he He's doesn't. He's not here for the paycheck. You Hell know? no. That's, Hell you know, no. So a lot of people, if, if they are there for the paycheck, eventually a lot of them move on. Unless you're, you know, some of the, you know, the top creators, you know, I'm sure Scott Snyder, uh, Jonathan Hickman, obviously Brian Michael Bennis, they bring in some good coin. 
things like that. But we even know when Brian Michael Bendis' time at Marvel, his ultimate goal was to be writing movies. Yep. And after Powers didn't really work out for PlayStation Network, we never saw him get any more offers. No more adaptations. They didn't try to turn Torso into a Netflix series. They didn't try to do Powers on, you know, Paramount Network or anything. They didn't try doing any of his other work, adapting it into anything. So really, that's another hurdle that DC and Marvel have created is the pay scale. While the upper crust certainly get compensated well, for the most part, if, if you're a competent writer, you can probably do the Brian Hill route and go write some screenplays. Even that, you could probably just go doctor some screenplays up, maybe not get the, the full credit, but, you know, fix some things. And I'm sure they throw more money his way than he was getting for Fallen Angels. Now, I'm does he write a so comic too. book every once in a while? Yeah, he's got Cherry coming out. For the most part, he's not a comic writer anymore. He doesn't need to be. Yeah, he's you know, got that thing at AWA. Game. Yeah, they're, they're going up there. They're storyboarding and, and doing things of that nature, making things for video games. Somebody needs to come along, and, and you're going to have to compensate people. It's yeah. going to happen eventually, but just to overcome just all the obstacles that DC and Marvel and their incompetence and really the, the acquiescence of, of the comic industry at large to let them do this virtually unchecked. Well, readers stopped giving, you know, stopped holding them accountable. Whatever little bit of comic media that existed, especially in the early days of Wizard when they would actually try to hold companies accountable, that all went away whenever everybody realized, oh, wait, I can just kiss ass and get working comics instead. The the media just never held them accountable. Every Everybody, there, there's... They just let them get away with everything. And anytime somebody told them this is short-sighted and stupid, the industry just said, fine, you'll never work in us. Yeah. And then it's crazy we're at the point where, you know, there is hope. And I, I truly do believe that the, this thing will start growing and, and comic books will be big again, but it will be in spite of DC and Marvel. And it'll be because you're overcoming, uh, you know, a lot of the mistakes that they've made, but I do not believe in my heart of hearts, even with the character libraries that they have, and they are substantial, and they're wonderful, and they're parts of Americana, they're parts of uh, of history that, that need to be cherished and, and loved. It's probably going to have to go on without them, and then eventually you go and acquire that stuff after the fact. Maybe. Um, you know, I, I think the best chance for that was whenever you had, like... Um, early image with the original studios. Uh, and then again, when even some of those studios broke into um, their own companies, Aspen and Top Cow, maybe, but I, I don't see, I don't see the solution at this point. I think, I think the, the whole is too We haven't deep. had the mind come in yet. I, I don't, like I said, I don't think image is a solution. I don't, like kind of the way they do their setup. I don't think Marvel or DC, but it's going to happen eventually because someone's going to see an opportunity. There's there's a there's an audience waiting for this stuff. They want it to be affordable. They want it to be quality. And they want to enjoy it again. The problem so, is manga is sitting right there, and you have to compete with that too. Yeah, somebody somebody needs to come in and needs to to sell a half million copy of some indie book and then spin it out from there grow it from well, there that just happened boom yeah well they, they, five thousand copies of berserker so they need to do it monthly though that's well, the I, problem I think berserker's supposed to be monthly yeah well no what i mean is they have to keep those numbers monthly oh yeah well they never do that. <laughs> that but that's the problem you, you if you're not hitting like well over a hundred thousand issues or copies of every single issue 200,000 copies you're never it doesn't matter the price scale can't be brought down to a reasonable amount the quality of the the product can't be you need the only solution to this is massive growth in volume volume and and, and the and the and the growth must be on a monthly basis you can't just hit it out of the park with one issue and then go down to 50,000 issues the 50,000 copies for the rest of the run you just can't it has to be sustained 
volume. Well, that's not going to be happening anytime soon because re- the way you get to 635 is speculators. But, Doc, we are running up against the time here. I think we had a very good conversation about this. Uh, hopefully, you know, we'll we'll delve into it a little bit deeper uh, in the future. I'll let you have the last word. Hey, I, I, I hope that I'm wrong on this. I just think that the comic industry, there's too many catch-22s. 